So then today is the second Sunday after Easter, Good Shepherd Sunday. I'm going to be back here this evening in Kentucky. And the epistle for this second Sunday after Easter, the Good Shepherd Sunday, taken with the first epistle of St. Peter, chapter 2. Beloved, Christ has suffered for us, leaving you an example, that you may follow in his steps, who did no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, did not revile, when he suffered, did not threaten, but yielded himself to him who judged him unjustly, who himself bore our sins in his body upon the tree, that we, having died to sin, might live to justice, and by his stripes you are healed. For you are a sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. And then the gospel, taking that according to St. John chapter 10. At that time, Jesus said to the Pharisees, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. But the hireling who is not a shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches and gathers, scatters the sheep. But the hireling flees because he is a hireling and has no concern for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know mine, and mine know me. Even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for my sheep. And other sheep I have that are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Thus far the words of today's Holy Gospel. So in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Today a few considerations in part of this mystery of the Good Shepherd and the new creation that God created between Good Friday and Easter Sunday. St. Leo the Great says in his sermon today that God gave us new eyes. You know that we say after the resurrection, we say that in the offertory of the Mass, that God created man wonderfully, but mirabilius reformasti. He more wonderfully reformed him, more wonderfully recreated him. When he recreated man more wonderfully, he had to change things. He had to change his eyes, change his ears, change his mouth, change his body. Or else he would not be recreated. Therefore he gave to us new eyes, new ears, and so on. And that is one of the reasons why it says in multiple places in the gospel, He that has eyes to see, let him see. He that has ears to hear, let him hear. For there are they shall see, but they shall not believe. And they shall hear, and they shall not understand. For there are different kinds of eyes. And God gave one kind of eyes to Adam. But when he made the new Adam, when the new Adam came to this earth, there came a different kind of eyes. He reformed our eyes. Remember when God created man, he, unlike the other creatures, all the other creatures, God simply said, let there be light and light was made. Let there be a dog and there was a dog from nothing. Let there be a cat and there was a cat from nothing. But when he created man, he made him from the slime of the earth and he formed him and he breathed the spirit into him. And he said, let him make man into our own image and likeness. And then he made him from the slime of the earth and he formed him. There was a little process in the creation of man because there's a special sacred creation. So likewise, he had to reform man. And the place where man was reformed was in the upper room. In the upper room were 11 cowardly and, and sorrowful and weeping apostles waited. But they did not know for what they were waiting. They went up into that upper room, and there they were in anguish and sorrowful even unto death. And the world that they knew before was finished. And would never return. And they knew not the world that was in front of them. Like a little baby when he enters into the womb. He does not know the world on the outside. It is blocked from him. But he is going into another world. And when he enters into that world at birth. It, she shall never return to the world in which he was. 
He's going into a new world. He is going to be born into a new world. And the apostles are going to be born in the name of all humanity. Into a new flesh. New eyes, new ears, new tongue. And that is why he had to create a new priesthood. If he is going to make a new man, there will also have to be a new priesthood for this new man. There will have to be a new kind of shepherd. And this shepherd was a prophesied in the book of Ezekiel. And when our Lord Jesus Christ stood up in the gospel today, and he said, I am the good shepherd. When he said those words, he made the Pharisees, he made the Sadducees, he made the high priest, he made all of the Jewish priests very angry. Because the good shepherd is prophesied in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 34. And in that chapter, it begins with the wicked shepherds. God intended that his sheep always have shepherds. He never left his sheep without shepherds. This is one of the many scriptural evidences against the foolishness and ignorance and error and heresy of Protestantism, which denies God and denies scripture. God always gave shepherds for his sheep. Always. And he had the shepherds of the Old Testament and shepherds of the New. But he goes to the shepherds. And he speaks to the shepherds in Ezekiel 34. And he says, you are wicked shepherds. And he curses the shepherds. And he says, the wicked things that the shepherds have done. You are made, I made you the shepherd of the sheep, but behold, you have driven the sheep off the pastures. Behold, you have shorn them in the winter time that they freeze. Behold all the wickedness that you have done to the sheep, and every sheep that is lost, I shall have an accounting at your hand. And he is very angry at the shepherds. So when our Lord Jesus Christ says, I am the good shepherd, all of the Caiaphas and Annas and all the priests of the Old Testament are very angry because they know that by him saying he's the good shepherd, he is going to replace the wicked shepherds, and they are the wicked shepherds. They were prophesied in Ezekiel chapter 34. And we can say also, these wicked shepherds have come back to the church. The wicked shepherds are here again. And Christ, in order to make it clear that he's speaking about the same kind of shepherds, that they not be confused, he speaks about the hireling. And he says what the good shepherd does. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Now what is interesting about this laying down the life for the sheep is that it is more than saving sheep. St. Paul understood that, the greatest of all the apostles. He said, I have carried you in my bowels. I have borne you. All of the children of the Gentiles who receive the faith, they are born. And when our Lord Jesus Christ said, I am your mother, I am your father, I am your sister, I am your brother. These words can also be said of the new priest of the New Testament. Who is it that has the child? Who is it that has the birth pangs in the New Testament? It is the priest. The priest is to carry the catechumen through his steps on his way to the Catholic faith. He's to carry the penitent on his way to taking away his sins and accusing himself of his sins. He's to assist the penitent in accusing himself of his sins. He's to assist the catechumen to learn his faith and to enter into the faith. And he has the pain inside of himself. And a new child is born. A new child is born. A new life is created. We are given new eyes. We are given new ears. We are given a new tongue so that we do not have the eyes of the Old Testament. As St. Paul says, it was a testament of darkness, whereas we are a testament of light. It was a testament of death, whereas we are the testament of life. For there was no life in the Old Testament. It only pointed to the life. It pointed to the life because the life will not come until Jesus Christ dies on that cross. Until he establishes his holy church. Until he sends his apostles out into the world. But we have the mystery of these apostles and the power of our church because God has allowed that in the church, both of the Old Testament and of the New, that there be wicked shepherds. And there are many wicked shepherds in the church today. And there have always been some wicked shepherds from the church from the beginning, such as Judas and Simon Peter, who denied Christ three times before he repented. 
And there will always be wicked shepherds in the church. And God allows, as we mentioned last night in a little consideration in Quebec, why does God allow wicked shepherds? He allows it in order to test our faith. Do we really believe that God is God? Do we really believe that He is the creator of our holy church? Do we really believe that He has the power to bring victory and salvation to souls, even through the hands of wicked shepherds? Because God wanted to make it very clear that He alone gives the victory against the devil, and He is the one who brings salvation to souls. And He chooses weak men, such as Moses, and all the prophets of the Old Testament. He chooses weak men, such as those twelve apostles in order to bring Christ to souls, to bring the truth to souls. And he deliberately chooses weak men because he wants the world to know that any goodness that comes through the hands of these fools comes from God and not these fools. And therefore God makes sure that there will always be weak soldiers in his army. And even though there will always be weak soldiers in his army, his army is never defeated. Even now, we have the greatest attack against the Catholic Church in the last 2,000 years, and yet somehow it still barely survives. And it will have victory over the devil. But what is this good shepherd? St. Gregory the Great says, The good shepherd is the one who lays down his life for his sheep. And God is speaking here, I am the good shepherd. And he says, I have made shepherds, they are supposed to lay down their lives for their sheep, but they have not laid down their lives for their sheep. Not only have they not laid down their lives for their sheep, but they've driven the sheep away. And why have they done this? Because of what sacred scripture calls the root of all evil. Money. The love of money. He is a hireling. What is a hireling? He's a man that fights. He's a man that works for rupees. <laughs> He works for money. He does not work for good. He does not work for the salvation of souls. He does not work for God. He works as long as the cash holds out. <laughs> and as long as someone doesn't make a bigger offer. This was the case of Simon Magus. Who wanted to become a priest of the New Testament. And he was ready to pay for it. And he was punished by God. And the fact is that we, we, there's a great temptation of many souls. And the way in which the devil is going to destroy the church, or the majority of souls in the church when the Antichrist comes, is by the way of hirelings. By the way of hirelings. For now, not only are the priests hirelings, but all are hirelings. This is a hallmark of Protestantism called the prosperity gospel. It's a hallmark of it. The Lord blessed me, and the Lord blessed me, and I know what I didn't find. I, I was living an evil life, and I was living a horrible life, and I was poor, and I was on drugs, and I was having a horrible life, and then I found the Lord, and after I found the Lord, I got a good job, and after I found the Lord, I got a nice house, and after I found the Lord, of course, I don't care about these things, none of my cars, none of my things, I don't care about them, but this is what happened after I found the Lord. And they always associate the blessings of the Lord with material blessings. And no material blessings, no blessings of the Lord. And therefore the Lord is good if He gives me material things. The Lord is not good if He does not. And so all have become hirelings. And this spirit has entered into Christianity. It has entered into the Catholic Church. And it is very important because it is this primary practical preparation for the Antichrist. Because what does the Satan do when he makes that final temptation... I will give you all the things in the world if falling down thou wilt adore me. Most people aren't willing to adore Satan. But if they worship things, if they need that car, if they need that cell phone, if they need those things more than they need life, then when the devil comes and says, you must worship the Antichrist, you must worship Satan directly and publicly and explicitly, this is what he will demand, a public adoration. And if you don't, you lose the material things. You lose your position. You lose your credit card doesn't work anymore. And you, don't, you can't buy and sell food anymore. And they will buy the millions 
in fact, by the billions, wander away from God because they are hirelings. And what happened to the hirelings? Our Lord Jesus Christ says, they are hirelings because their own, the sheep are not. They're not connected to the sheep. They don't realize that when God recreated man, He made the priest a father. We are called fathers in the New Testament. They were not called fathers in the Old Testament. But what is a father? A father is a father whether his kids are good or his kids are bad. <laughs> A father always has responsibility toward his children. The bad ones he must try to bring back the straight way. The good ones he must take care of and encourage them to continue along the good way. The wicked ones he must punish. The good ones he must help. But he has responsibility towards all his children. The good and the bad. And we have the most important of all fathers on earth who is the Holy Father. And he has the responsibility of all men. And he has a responsibility to bring all souls into the new life that God created. And St. Leo the Great says, he recreated the eyes. He did not waste his time between Easter Sunday and Ascension Thursday. He spent that time well and not fruitlessly. And what he did was, he took away the error of the eyes. The first thing he did, or one of the things that he did. He came to the apostles on Holy Thursday, Holy Easter Sunday night, and he said, and he went and stood, went through the doors that were shut, and they saw him, but they did not believe their eyes. Though they saw Christ, they didn't believe. And this is what's happening now. It will happen also at the end of the world. The souls see miracles. You can go and buy an airplane ticket, and you can fly and see a miracle. You can see the incorrupt body of St. Bernadette, and take a picture next to it. You can go and make a visit to Mexico City and stand next to a miraculous picture of Our Lady of Guadalupe and take another picture. My visit to Mexico City. My visit to uh, Bernadette. My visit to this miraculous place and that miraculous place. And you can see the miracles. You can now buy the plane tickets and you can fly and see the miracles. But they see the miracles, but they do not believe. They see the evidences of this holy church for 2,000 years and they do not believe because they do not have eyes. These are the eyes in which Christ spoke. Behold, they have eyes, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Therefore, the eyes have to be reformed. And where were the eyes reformed? And this reformation is going to happen very soon in the mystical body of Christ. The apostles became blind on Good Friday. They became blind. For they stood in front of Jesus Christ and they watched Him die for their sins, but they did not believe. They thought He was gone forever. They thought He was being defeated and they did not know that He was having the victory over Satan. That He was, going, he was defeating hell. They became blind. Therefore, they had to be transformed. Peter denied Christ three times, calling him a man, cursing and swearing that he did not know the man. The other apostles fled as cowards, and this was the glory of the church just before the death of Jesus Christ. And now we are in the same situation in the mystical body of Christ. And there is coming a chastisement. I was speaking to a priest in, in Poland, visiting Poland a couple of days ago in Krakow. 95-year-old priest, Franciscan, and an uh, exorcist. And he says, there's coming soon this chastisement. People think of a chastisement as a punishment from God and as his vengeance on the sins of man. But yet, when we look at man, when we look at God, we see that he has never shown vengeance in the past. And he doesn't punish very well. But there will come this chastisement. But what is it? It is not a punishment. It will not be a vengeance of God. It will be medicine. And it will be a cleansing. When the grease is in the pot and it sticks very hard, you must take a hard brush. You must rub very hard. And you clean the pot. And medicine sometimes when a man is very sick must be very strong. And it tastes very bad. But the good God will never give us vengeful punishment, but He will give bitter medicine. 
And he will give a cleansing. But he will rather be like the God coming into the kitchen where all the pots are dirty and he's getting ready to make a big feast. You can't make a big feast with all those germs and all that poison in the pot. And so the first thing he does is clean the kitchen. He cleans it. And so he will clean this world. And it will be a cleansing. And his thought the whole time will be to cleanse this church. To cleanse these souls so that they can be reformed. And this is what happened to the apostles. He allowed their blindness on Good Friday. Because without their blindness, they would not be able to leave the eyes of the world. They were so accustomed to the eyes of the world. It was the only eyes they knew. They were so accustomed to the ears of the world. It was too much in them even after three and a half years with Christ. So therefore, he had to send them sorrow and great anguish. And what happened during that time of sorrow and anguish? They went and spent time with the Holy Mother of God. They went for three days in the upper room with the Blessed Virgin Mary. And while they wept, and while they were confused, and while they were blind... She was gently preparing them. She knew that her son would see them, but they weren't ready to see him. Yet, like little puppies when they're born, they're blind for a few days, a few weeks, and then their eyes open. It takes time. And so likewise, the apostles needed a transformation time between the time of the death of Christ and the time of their rebirth. And St. Leo speaks about the opening of their eyes. He says they stood in front of him or he stood in front of them, but they didn't believe their eyes. And so therefore he said, give me fish. And remember the beautiful sermon of St. Anthony, when he preached to the fishes, a sermon we mention often. St. Anthony said to the fishes, among many things, that there are two great glories of the fish. When he preached to those fish, because the heretics wouldn't listen to him in Rimini, and he called the fish out of the water, and he spoke to them. And the fish put their heads out of the water and he spoke to them a long sermon. But two things he mentioned in that sermon were, O ye fishes, you have two great glories. One is that God loved you so much that when he decided to kill all the animals on earth, he did not kill the fishes. He brought the flood and he killed all the animals, but he didn't kill the fishes because he loved you too much. He made an exception for the fishes, and therefore you should be grateful to God who loved you so much that when he killed all the others, he didn't kill you. And all the fishes bowed their heads. And later on he said, what is the greatest glory of the fish? The greatest glory of the fish is was you or the instrument that he used on the day of the resurrection. What was the first food that Christ wanted to eat when he rose from the dead? He'd been hungry. He hadn't eaten for three days. He had fish. He ate the fish. And why did he eat this fish? In order to show to the apostles that he was really man. Angels cannot eat. To show that it was a real resurrection. And the greatest glory of the fish is you are the proof of the resurrection. And so they saw him eat fish. And then their eyes were opened completely. And the scales fell off their eyes. And St. Leo says, remember those early eyes. The eyes of innocence that God gave Adam. And the eyes of innocence that God gave Eve. In the beginning of time. What happened? God came and walked with them. And they were not to be found. And he said, why are you not to be found? They said, we were naked. And God said to them, how did you know you were naked? I never told you you were naked. You could not know that you were naked unless you ate of the forbidden tree. The scales fell off of their eyes and they could see evil and they could see a weak, naked nakedness and they could see sin. They could not see it before. But then, now the eyes had to be recreated. And now the eyes... What are the eyes of the New Testament? They are the opposite of the eyes of, of Adam and Eve who became aware of evil in the midst of a good world. What are the sacred eyes that God gives to us? To those who have the faith, the eyes that can see the infinite goodness of God, the power and the love of God in the midst of the greatest human and demonic wickedness. What happens at every Mass? When we get to the consecration of the Mass, Jesus Christ dies. But we do not weep. His body and blood are separated. The real body of Christ comes to the altar. 
The real body and blood are sacramentally separated and he dies. But we do not weep. We rejoice. Because it is by this separation and by this death that we have life. There is a transformation. And what happened on the cross? It was the day in which the greatest wickedness of all men, of all time, visited Christ in the fullness of its wickedness. But then an eye of a thief was opened. And the thief looked over at Jesus Christ and he said, Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. His eyes were opened. And so likewise, our Lord wants to open our eyes in this time of the crisis of the church. Do you have faith? Do you really believe? Our church is now being crucified. We have wicked bishops. We have a wicked pope. We have wicked priests. Wickedness it is in all of our churches. But do we have eyes? Do we see that no matter how wicked Caiaphas is, God can still operate through His church? No matter how wicked the priests are, God can still convert them. He converted Augustine. He converted Mary Magdalene. He can convert Pope Francis. We have to have faith. And the good shepherd will lay down his life for his sheep. And what will happen when he dies? He said what would happen. Unless the seed falls to the ground and dies, it remaineth itself alone. And this is what Christ teaches the priests. But priests don't want to listen. We want to receive the collection. St. Gregory talks about it 1,400 years ago. He says, Behold the clergy. They like the honors that they receive. And they forget the honors are because they are representatives of God. They like the honors they receive. They like their pension. They like their rectories. And they become hirelings. And what are you supposed to do as a shepherd? And St. Gregory says these words to the, to the priests, which is in his sermon today on this Good Shepherd Sunday. He says, you must give of your possessions to the sheep. You must take your money and give it to the sheep. You must take your things and use it for the sheep. For if you cannot take your things and give them to the sheep, how will you be able to lay down your life for your sheep when the test comes? How will you be able to do it? For who cannot give his things to the sheep will not be able to die for the sheep. And he tells that specifically to the priests. And therefore, Christ also said, unless the seed falls to the ground and dies, it remaineth itself alone. Many priests in the church today are alone. In fact, the priest told me in Poland, the Polish priest, he's actually from America, he's an American, but of Polish descent and returned back to Poland, now 95 years old. Four religious each month in Poland alone commit suicide every month. Because there's so much depression in the clergy today. So much. They are alone. They feel alone. They feel abandoned. And suicide is up. And why is it up? Because they are not ready to die. For if you do not die, you remain yourself alone. We must be ready to pour ourselves out. And that is essential to the making of the new man. Because there is a mirabilius reformasti created man. Do we believe in the new creation? There is a new creation that happens at every holy sacrifice of the mass. The recreation of souls. They're recreated in baptism. They're recreated in confirmation. They're recreated in the sacrament of holy orders. They're recreated by the grace of God. And the good shepherd must die that there might come life. The good shepherd must die that the sheep may enter into the divine sheepfold. There is no way around it. No way. And so also in the church today, Christ never changes. He never changes. We must pray for shepherds. He uses human shepherds. We must pray for shepherds who are ready to lay down their life for their sheep. Who go away from being hirelings. We must pray for the conversion of the shepherds. 
and they will transform the eyes to see with the supernatural eyes the power and the goodness of God in the midst of great wickedness, and the ears to be able to hear the faith, and the mouth to be able to speak the divine truth when there is nothing but lies being spoken all over the world. We must have a great confidence. And then our Lord says, I must go and get other sheep. I have other sheep I have that are not of this fold. Them also I must bring. Well, portent may it behooves me to bring. And they shall hear my voice. There shall be one fold and one shepherd. And this Pope Francis doesn't know. He wants to hear the voice of all the other shepherds who are not shepherds, they are wolves. He wants to hear the voice of all the liars and all the heretics. We have the great denial of Christ of the last three Assisi's. Paul Assisi 1, worshiping the false religions in 86. Assisi 2 in 2000. Assisi 3 again in 2011. And the worshiping with the false religions. The head of the true church of Jesus Christ, worshiping with false religions. This is a mockery against God. And it equals the mockery that Simon Peter gave on Good Friday morning, where he denied Christ three times. Now we await for the victory of the conversion of Peter. That he weep for his sins. And that he recognize he has the power in his voice. He must speak the voice of our Lord Jesus Christ. He must speak the words of Christ. And then the sheep will hear the voice. Because I know mine and mine know me. They know the sound of the voice. But the voice is not speaking. Therefore we must pray to God. That he convert the shepherds, especially the shepherd who is the head of our holy church. That he listen to God. That he comes to great Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. That he begin to speak the divine truth. God has the power to turn Francis into a greater saint than St. Pius X, if he wants. His grace is powerful. More powerful than the Satan who the present leaders of the church are now following. He can transform. But what must happen is, the good shepherd must die for his sheep. And he must pray for this great victory of the good shepherd. In our great crisis in the church, he is going to win. We must maintain our faith and pray for the victory of the shepherd and make it close as possible to the Blessed Virgin Mary who formed this new life in these 11 apostles as they wept there in that womb of the upper room, being transformed without their own knowledge between the death of Christ and his resurrection by the Holy Mother. And then... They saw him and they never doubted again. And they went out and converted the world. These same apostles that were cowards were transformed. And if God could transform cowards into great apostles in the past, he can transform cowards into great apostles now. Therefore, let's pray to God that he transform the present cowards in our holy church, the present hirelings in our holy church, to become good shepherds and apostles to spread his faith and to make sure that the voice of the Good Shepherd is heard. And then the sheep will listen. And they will return a great glory to our Holy Church. God bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. First epistle, epistle from the third Sunday after Easter, taken from the first epistle of St. Peter, chapter 2. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims to refrain yourselves from carnal desires, which war against the soul, having your conversation good among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by the good works to which they shall behold in you glorify God in the day of visitation. Be ye subject, therefore, to every human creature for God's sake. Whether it be to the king as excelling, or to the governor as is sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, and for the praise of the good. For so is the will of God that by doing well you men may be you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free and not as making liberty a cloak for malice, but as the servants of God. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Servants be subject to your masters. With all fear, not only to the good and gentle, uh, but also to the froward. For this is thankworthy in Christ Jesus our Lord. And the Gospel, saying that according to St. John chapter 16. At that time, Jesus said to his disciples, 
a little while and now you shall not see me, and again a little while and you shall see me, because I go to the Father. That some of his disciples said one to another, What is this that he said to us? A little while and you shall not see me, and again a little while and you shall see me, and because I go to the Father. They said therefore, What is this that he saith? A little while. We know not what he speaketh. And Jesus knew that they had a mind to ask him, and he said to them, Of this do you inquire among yourselves? Because I said, A little while you shall not see me, and again a little while and you shall see me. And many men I say to you, that you shall lament and weep, but the world shall rejoice. And you shall be made sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in labor, hath sorrow, because her hour is come. But when she hath brought forth the child, and she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is come and is born into the world. So also you now indeed have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man shall take from you. That's for the words of today's holy gospel. Amen. We're now in the middle of this season between the victory of the resurrection and the returning to the Father on the day of the ascension. And uh, few considerations concerning this little while. In fact, this little while that is spoken of by our Lord in the Gospel, spoken of in the, in the, uh, the talk that he gave on Holy Thursday night, just before his crucifixion to the Apostles. And St. Uh, Augustine speaks about it. it. says that the time between the resurrection of Christ, the time between the resurrection of Christ and Pentecost, and the return of Christ into the, the world, is a little while. It's a very short time. It will not be a long period of time. And that uh, in this little while, many things will happen. And concerning this little while also, the very life of a man is a little while. As it says in the book of the Psalms, in one of the Psalms, it says that the man's life is like a breath. A breath that goes out from the body and does never return. So the life of a man is like one little breath. And then that breath never returns. A very brief life. And it is fragile and short-lived. It is a little while. The whole life of a man is a little while. And also when we look upon the whole history of the world, particularly when we get into eternity, which is forever, goes on forever and ever and ever. When we look back upon the 6,000 years of the history of the world, we will see that the whole 6,000 years is a little while. And our whole years that we spent on the earth is a little while. And we're here for a very brief time. But we notice things about this little while. That there's a little while, I am not with you, because he goes to the Father. That's the history of the world, between Pentecost and the end of the world. And during that time, the world shall rejoice. That's all that's going to happen to the world. To those that are the enemies of God, they shall rejoice. They shall have laughter. And this laughter is very short-lived. And it will be a laughter like the laughter of the damned. The laughter of despair. The laughter of those that have turned away from God. It is a very brief laughter, and it ends with suicide. It ends with death. It ends with damnation. And that's the only thing that happens. A brief laughter. And it is interesting also, as we're getting closer and closer to the end of the world, and getting closer and closer to the reign of the Antichrist, laughter has become a multi-billion dollar business. That you have the, all, all the great increase in the comedy shows and comedy events, that fake laughter must be poured into man. Laughter is poured into man. The rejoicing in the world is a fake rejoicing. It is to cover up a sadness of spirit. A noise to cover up a sadness of spirit. And so as the world becomes more and more immersed in sin, and more and more wicked, there's more and more need for this fake laughter. And so in a little while of the world, the world rejoices. But then he says to the apostles, But you shall be sorrowful. And you, you shall have tears. Your sorrow shall be turned into joy. That joy no man shall take from you. So three things will happen to the just. And only one to the damned. They have a brief laughter. They do not have a real rejoicing. But a brief rejoicing of false laughter. And that's it. They simply try to uh, take pleasures in this world. They're trying to find pleasures 
to uh, allay whatever sorrows and difficulties that they have, or they're looking for their, their pleasures in this life. And it's brief, it ends. But for those that follow Christ, there will be three things. First of all, the sorrow. Secondly, the sorrow shall be turned into joy. And then thirdly, the joy no man shall take from you. And then the reason is because it is likened to a mother that's going to have a child. And he gives the explanation of why. That a mother is going to have a child. She is sorrowful because her time has come. What is the cause of the sorrow? The cause of the sorrow is the removal of sin. The recognition of the wickedness of sin. And the, the, the penance of the taking away of sin. The woman is sorrowful because her time has come. There will be a painful giving birth. But what is the time? It is a time of giving birth. It is a time of bringing a child into life. It is a the time of bringing a new life into the world. And so in fact, the sorrow is a very beautiful sorrow. And it is a very joyful sorrow. Because it is a sorrow that is going to bring life. It is a sorrow that is temporary. And those that follow Christ do experience a sorrow. But the sorrow is temporary. And also, there must be a sorrow. There must be a kind of sorrow in the resurrected Christ. That is why when he rose from the dead, he left wounds inside of his hands. Wounds and scars inside of his feet. And scars on his side. He could have easily risen from the dead without any scars. But he kept scars. And these scars show, these scars show to us in a visible way what we would say in the offertory of the Mass. That he mirabilius reformasti. He more wonderfully recreated man. And that more wonderfully recreated man must look different. He has to look different. And so this is during this time of ascension, and Easter to the ascension, we're considering that reformed, recreated man. He looks different. He sounds different. He walks differently. He has a different way about him than the original man that God created. And in order to make it clearly visible, we find that Christ moves differently after the resurrection. He passes through doors that are shut. He goes and appears to one in one place and to another in another. At the same time that he's speaking to Mary Magdalene, he is also going to be appearing to St. Peter. He is also walking on the way to Emmaus with the two disciples. He appears to others as well. And he appears and he comes and appears and disappears. He goes in and out. His movement is different. His body is different. He is not the same. And that is one of the reasons why when the, 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 this, this, the, he is so much better, so much reformed, so to speak. And he's showing the reformation of man. So that man is going to have to be different after God recreates him. When we enter into baptism, we enter one kind of man. When we come out of baptism, we come out a new man. A new recreated man. And this recreated man has to be a carrier of the gospel of Christ. And it must be carried in scars or with scars. And these scars are a kind of sorrow, but they're sorrow like unto the mother that's giving birth. They are not a deep sorrow. They are not a real sorrow. They are only a feeling of a temporary pain before the great glory of a new life. And the great glory of a victory of a new child coming to the world. Christ is going to be brought into the world. But it will not happen without scars on the hands and scars on the feet of the mystical body of Christ. And so what are the signs? The people today, they don't believe. They do not believe that Jesus Christ is God. They don't believe in the Creator. They don't believe in the Creator. They want to see signs of the Creator. And any man knows, if he looks at the world around him, that there is order in the universe. That there is beautiful order in the universe. This order makes us lift up to the God who created us. But what about the recreation? There must be signs of the recreation also. Just as there were signs of the original creation, we know that God is beautiful and wonderful because of the beauty of the stars, the beauty of the planets, the beauty of the earth, the beauty of the animals, the beauty of the order which He created. But there must be visible to man also the recreation. And that is why God wants there to be Catholics. First of all, the Pope, and then the bishops and the priests, but then also all of the faithful, who must be mobile recreations of God. They have to go about the world showing the miracle of God's work inside of souls. That here is a hand that gives in charity with scars. A hand, a foot that carries the gospel with nails in it. So that when we go to carry Christ in the world, what is the sign? 
that we are carrying a supernatural Christ and not just a natural Christ. It is a sign that we carry Him under attack, that we carry Him wounded, that we carry Him alone, that we carry Him in a world that denies Him with scars. Scars are the sign of the supernatural. And so that when the world is not grateful for our acts of charity, when we are condemned for our acts of goodness, when there is no reward for the acts of charity, and yet the charity comes super abundantly, then these are signs of the supernatural. And then that, there, that we're re, this is a recreated man, and the recreated foot that carries the gospel, regardless of who denies it, or how much it is denied, or how much it is rejected, we continue to carry the gospel of truth on our feet throughout the world. And the wound in the side, the wounds in the heart, there must be wounds in the heart of the apostle. There must be wounds in the feet. There must be wounds in the hands. Or else we are not carrying the supernatural Christ. And so therefore, if God, we expect the world to accept the recreator, the one who recreated man by his redemption, people need to see it with their eyes. And God expects that the way to see it with their eyes is the incarnation of the mystery of his divine charity the mystery of His divine faith and divine truth must be visible to human eyes because they see it in the followers of Christ. And one of the great tragedies of our time is that the followers of Christ, those who have the true faith, they are not carrying it in wounds. They are not carrying it in suffering. They are not ready to administer the truth of Christ if there's no security. They're not ready to administer the love of Christ if there's no reward. And they're not ready to, to, to pour their hearts out in the love of God without others knowing or being involved in some kind of visible reward. And, yet, and so therefore, there are less and less carriers. Less and less carriers of the supernatural. We must, all of us Catholics, obviously firstly the clergy, but not only the clergy, the faithful, must also be with the sacrament of baptism and confirmation, carriers of this mystical, miraculous, recreated human nature. And they are during this little while, they must experience the three things. They must experience a little sorrow. Sorrow that is turned into joy. And a joy that no man can take from us. When we have the faith, their joy can never be taken away. The worst they can do is kill us, or torture us, or take away all that we have. Which, if they don't kill us, we will die. If they don't torture us, we will suffer in sickness. And if they don't take away all we have, we will lose it. So we have two options. Lose everything you have, or lose everything you have. Lose your life, or lose your life. Lose your possessions, or lose your possessions. And so what is the better choice? The one that gets you something out of it. So if we lose our life for the love of God, it is no loss. But if we lose our life without the love of God, we lose all. And so we're going to lose our life anyway. It would be reasonable for a man to be damned. It would be reasonable for a man to choose wickedness. If during a little while, the good man would lose his life, but the bad man would keep it. The good man would suffer, but the bad man would not suffer. The good man will lose all his possessions, but the bad man will not lose all his possessions. And yet, every human being will lose his possessions. Every human being will lose his health. Every human being will lose his life. And therefore, to lose these things, plus to lose the soul, is absolute imbecility. And for what? A brief second of rejoicing and an emptiness of life. We need to have a full life and a life in which our sorrow is turned into joy. The sorrow of the damned is not turned into joy. As it says in sacred scripture, the sorrows of the just man are many, but the sorrows of the fool are infinite. The fool suffers so much more, and then he dies and is damned. He has so much more sorrow, and he dies and he's damned. And that brief rejoicing of which Christ speaks is a small laughter, like the laughter of Caiaphas and the laughter of Annas on the day of the crucifixion. As they were on their way back to the temple, they laughed because Christ was dead or he was dying. But then when he, when he died, what happened? The temple was, the tent was ripped. There was an earthquake. 
and the, the, the veil was rent from top to bottom, and there was cracked, and they lost their priesthood. They lost their Old Testament priesthood, and they ceased to be priests. They lost everything that they had. Their, their rejoicing was a millisecond, and their sorrow eternal. Whereas the sorrow of Christ was for a few hours, and the rejoicing eternal. And so he gives us the example. Consider this little while, and let's beg of God the grace that we spend this little while being carriers of the recreated human nature, with its scars in the hands and scars in the feet, and a scar in the side that leads to great, eternal, irrevocable happiness, if we only love and live by our holy faith. Jose, God bless you all, and the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Feast of several martyrs, St. Nerius, Achilius, Domitila, and Pancratius. Four different martyrs, three of them martyred close together, another martyred a few hundred years later. And uh, the word martyr means witness, one that bore witness concerning the true faith. And that St. Gregory the Great tells us that uh, our Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> I believe it was St. Gregory, that he said that if our Lord wanted us only to praise Him, He would have made us only with heads. God did not make us only to praise Him, but He made our entire being. He made our, he made our heads, He made our bodies, He made our passions, He made our clothing, He made all things. And when God made these things, He made them for His own glory. We learn that when God made this entire universe... It was made out of nothing and was made by him because of his who show forth his goodness. And it says also in the book of Proverbs, I am a selfish God. I have made all things for myself. And there are really only two reasons for which God could have made the world. Either he made the world for nothing, for no reason at all, in which case the world has no purpose. And this is the teaching of most modern men. That we are aimlessly walking throughout the earth. That things just happen. Things just evolved out of pure chance. And things just happen, they have no purpose, and we are just simply condemned to live a miserable life and aimlessly and purposely, without purpose, until we die. But yet when we open our eyes and we see the world around us, we see that there is perfect order in it. And the more that the modern scientists study this world, the more perfect they see is the order. Charles Darwin and the other idiots who followed him used to say that, you know, there's a lot of meaningless and purposeless things in the world. But yet the more we study the world, the more that we see that every single thing has a purpose. All of the trees, all of the leaves, the sun, the carbon dioxide, the oxygen, the oxygen is fed to us by the trees, but it's no good for the trees. Carbon dioxide is eaten by the trees, but it's no good for us. And so by, the, by our waste comes the life of the tree, and by their waste comes the life of man. And all things are interconnected, and every single thing is perfect. And every single thing has a purpose. And every single thing comes from God. And every single thing must be returned to God. That is the reason why when the three young men stood in front of the king Nebuchadnezzar, and they were commanded to worship the false god, the 60-foot god that was built by Nebuchadnezzar. And they said, if you don't worship this false god, and you don't sing the praises when the, tr when the trumpets blow, when the music plays, you will be cast into the fire. And the three young men said, no, we're not waiting until 6 p.m. We're not waiting until the trumpets. We will never worship this false god. The king was angry and threw him in the furnace. He heated the furnace seven times, more powerful than it was before, and threw them in the furnace. And the fire came out of the furnace and killed the, the soldiers that were throwing the three young men in the furnace. And the fire burnt the bands, the ropes that were tying the three young men. But it did not touch the three young men. The fire did not touch them. The fire did not make them hot. The fire did not harm them. And when the three young men landed into the furnace, they said, Ice and snow, fire and heat. Sun and moon, praise the Lord. 
And they named all the different parts of the universe because these three young men had common sense. They knew that the whole world was made for the glory of God. Not only our mouths or not only our hearts. One of the grave evils of Protestantism, which hit the world 500 years ago with Martin Luther, is that he began to say that only if you believe in God it is sufficient. Just believe and you shall be saved. And you simply have belief in your heart. And he used to say, Martin Luther, sin boldly, but believe more boldly. So as long as you believe more than you sin, you're okay. And this idea began to spread throughout the world. All that matters is that we must believe in God, or in some higher power, or in something wonderful or spiritual, which it becomes today, and we will be fine. And yet the real world is made by a real God. The God who made this world is more real than the world that he made. He made the fire. He made the rocks. He made the stars. He made all the living things and all the non-living things. And he put them together in a perfect harmony. If the sun decides to get a little closer to the earth, to take a closer look, we roast. If the sun decides to go for a walk a little further away, in boredom, we, we freeze. It must be precisely 93 million miles away. And we find that all of the things that he created are made in perfect harmony. And then he created man. He created man. When he created man, he made him the middle creature with something of all the earth in him and something of all the heavens in him. There's something inside of the, whatever is inside the whole earth is in some way inside of man. He is likened to the angels in that he has a mind. He is likened to the rocks in that he has mass and takes up space. He is likened to the plants in that he grows. He is likened to the animals in that he has sensation and movement. He is likened to all things in some way. And most importantly, God breathed into him and said, Let us make man unto our own image and likeness. And since God is the one who made the entire universe, which reflects a different part of the beauty of God, a different part of the truth of God, a different part of the power of God, if he is going to make man in his own image and likeness, there must be something of the entire of creation in man, since the same God made all of things, and there must be something special of God in man. That is why God gave man many elements. He gave him a mind and a will, like unto the angels. But then he also gave him the fullness of a body and passions that are between the mind and the will. And therefore man must render to God a special homage. It is rendered not only with his mind, it must be rendered with his heart. It is rendered not only with the mind and heart, it is rendered also with his mouth and with his body. And with all his possessions. And since man is made of something, of all things, something of all things is inside of him, he must understand God, he must praise God, and he must use all things to get to God. And this is one of the signs of a religion, that if God makes a religion for man, it must be a religion that involves the whole man, since God made all of man. He made our hair, and so we must find that there are certain men that get special haircuts that worship God, and they're called monks, and they get a round little bowl on the top of their head, and they get a special haircut. We even find in the Old Testament... The hair of Samson was sacred. He was not to touch a pair of scissors to his hair because it was consecrated to God and signified his great union with God. And therefore he could not get a haircut. And so also, there if God made the body, then the body must also be sacred. Therefore there must be certain bodies that are set aside only for God. And this is one of the hallmarks especially of the New Testament, but even also in certain times in the Old Testament, that those who consecrate themselves to God, their bodies must be separated from sexual pleasure. Their bodies must be separated from married life. Their bodies are consecrated to God. And we see this from the very beginning, such as the, 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 the Virgin Domitila, and all these young girls in the first centuries of the church, they gave themselves to God, and therefore they gave themselves not to men, and they gave themselves not to marriage. And from the very beginning of our church, there have always been virgins. And also it is interesting that these were the furthest virginity was the first sign that they were caught as the followers of Christ because the Romans were impure like our people today. They live and they are immersed in impurity. 
And they said, this man is pure. This woman is pure. They're Christians. They're followers of Christ. They worship that man God. They are follow the Galilean. And they were denounced. And they were brought before the emperor. And by the millions they were slain. And we celebrate four of their deaths today. They carry God in their bodies. They carry God in their hair. They carry God in their clothing. They carry God in their actions. They carry God in their possessions. They carry God in all the things and all the places in which they were. If we truly recognize the truth, which is God is the God who made all things, we must take our hands and in a certain way return all things to God. And so we carve out of marble statues which to show to us the presence of God. And that there is this, this is an image of the Blessed Virgin Mary and an image of the crucifix. We take clothing and we make vestments and we take all of the possessions of given to God. We give with them to God. A God commanded, for instance, in the Old Testament that there should be a tithing to the priests. There should be a giving of a tenth part of all things that we have to the priests in honor and order to give it to God. That we cannot say that we adore God if we don't take some of our possessions and set them aside for God. We don't take a special place in our house and set it aside for God. We must set aside things for God. There must be an external, human, visible sign of our adoration of God. And because of this external sign, which is called the confession, that we confess Christ, that we confess. To confess means to speak in front of men. To speak in front of another. When we have the sacrament of confession, what do you do? You kneel down in front of a priest and you confess. You speak up your sins so that they can be heard. What did you say? Say that again. I murdered three people. Oh, okay. So you have to say out loud what your sins are. That they can be heard. That is confession. And we are supposed to confess Christ because God gave us tongues. And the purpose of the tongue is to communicate the truth to others. Therefore, if we have tongues, we must go out into the world and we must communicate the truth to others. If we have bodies, they must be able to show that we are the followers of Christ. That is why Catholics wear scapulars. And they dress in a way different than the pagans. They don't dress like prostitutes. They don't dress like animals. They dress like human beings who are made in the image and likeness of God. They dress like those who are inclined to go to the heaven. And there must be some men who dress as priests, who are set aside for God. Some ladies who dress as the virgins set aside for God, such as the sisters and nuns of the church, the priests of the church. There must be a visible side of setting aside for God. And then this setting aside for God must be inside of the nation. It must be inside of the city. It must be inside of the family. It must be inside of the business. Which is why in the Catholic days, all businesses are blessed and consecrated to God. You will make sure that in this business, that you will worship God. You will gather together the employees and you will pray the Angelus in the morning and at noon and in the evening at six. And you will make sure that there is no taking of the name of God in vain inside of this business. And you will make sure that you are not stealing from the poor inside of this business. And you will make sure that there is a gift of charity to those that are in need from this business. And you will war operate honestly inside of this business for the purpose of the salvation of your soul. For the purpose of the spreading of the faith that others in seeing your good works might glorify God. Like we said in the gospel today. That they might see in your good works glorify God and come to God in the day of visitation. And so that there must be a visibility of our church. God's work must be visible. God's love must be visible. And this visibility is what caused the martyrs to become martyrs. They were caught. They were found out. And many of them made sure that they were caught and made sure they were found out because they publicly brought their faith before men. And this caused them to be executed, caused them to be their heads chopped off. And there was a great campaign from the beginning of time to spread lies amongst men, to spread lies everywhere in the world. And what's the purpose of these lies? To combat the truth. That's the purpose of lies. To combat the truth. And our Lord Jesus Christ said, I am the truth. 
Every lie is an attack against the truth. That is why it is important that we teach the children not to lie, whether it be about whether they took cookies out of the cookie jar, or whether they did their homework, or whatever it might be. They must not lie, because every lie is an attack against the truth. My pastor found his vocation because of that. When he was a little bitty boy, he had told a lie. And his mother smacked him, his Irish mother smacked him and beat him. And then she took him and she said, Francis, if you ever tell me a lie again, I will never believe anything you say for the rest of my life. And he was so terrified that his mother would not believe him that he never told a lie until he died 80 years later. And he, read, he realized that lies are the most terrible thing. And he wanted to be a man of the truth. And he felt the desire to go to the truth and to be an apostle of the truth. And therefore he became a priest. And so the fact is that there is, a, there is a war between all lies and the truth. And there is a war between the use of material things for selfishness and the use of material things for God. The war is total. God cares what you do with your money. God cares what you do with your clothing. God cares what you do with your time. He cares what you do with your hair. He cares what you do with everything in your life. He really cares. And note this, the devil cares also. That is why there is such a spreading in our wicked times of tattoos, for instance, which is a mutilation of the body that God gave. It is a sin. And this mutilation is done because the devil hates human flesh. He hates the, what God created and he wants to stain it. He wants to destroy it. And there is a war between the devil and his destruction of all the things that God gave to man, and God and his desire to elevate it. And in this world in which the devil rules in our century more than any other time, what has he done? He has made the women have haircuts like unto men, that they might be seen as lesbians. He has made the men wear earrings and makeup and act very effeminate, and so that they might be like homosexuals and destroy their manhood. He has changed the haircut and the hairdos. He has changed the style of walking. He has changed the glasses. He has changed everything. He has made the clothes immodest so that one might be always thinking about sin. He has made satanic symbolism inside of your barcode that you put in when you, when you run through a, uh, a, you buy something in the store, it has numbers in it. And three numbers are always six, six, and six in every barcode. Why is it necessary to have that? It's of no benefit whatsoever. But numbers matter to the devil, and numbers matter to God. The devil takes all things and he tries to twist them. And he, he makes sure that uh, the symbol of impurity, the symbol of wickedness is everywhere. And this is to combat God. And what does God need right now? He needs men that are going to bring back God in their hair, God in their shoes, God in their clothing, God in their actions, God in their houses, God in everything that they say and do, so that they will have holy pictures, and they will have rosaries, and they will have scapulars, and they will speak of the truth. And there will be, in the near future, once again, martyrs for Christ. And he says to the church of Smyrna, as we read in the breviary today, if you persevere unto death, you will not taste the second death. You will have a great crown. If we persevere unto death, we will not taste the second death. The second death is the eternal death. The first death is only temporary. Not only that, but the first death is the beginning of a new life, if we love God. If we do not love God, the first death is the beginning of a second death, which is eternal death. The first death is the death of the body. And the second death is the death of the soul. And the world is trying to take away God. And what do they say? First they tell you, keep God limited, because you're not ready to fully reject Him yet. And this was the great sin of Protestantism in the last 500 years. 
Oh, we say we love God. We still believe in Jesus. So say these liars. But we believe in Jesus. But Jesus, let him stay in your mind. You shouldn't honor the saints that he honored. You shouldn't worship God as he commanded to be worshipped. You shouldn't go to confession as he commanded to go to confession. You shouldn't honor Mary as he commanded to honor Mary. And all the different things that he commanded, one by one, they deny them all. And yet they still claim they believe in Christ. And this is an abomination before God. To claim that we believe in Christ and to reject his teaching. To claim that we believe in Christ and to reject his practice. This is a mockery of God. We find that Jesus Christ and God in the Old Testament, what did he do? He gave us priests. He made his religion fit the nature of man so that there were priests, men set apart for the worship of God. He made the divine worship of the Old Testament, the sacrificing of animals on the altar. He made his religion visible. He, made, he showed his power over the fire. He showed his power over the rocks. He showed his power over all things that they might know that he is truly God. With a wall of fire, he protected and separated the Jews from the evil Egyptians who were going to kill him. And then a great wall of water was built on either side of those Jews. And they walked through the wall of water in the Red Sea. And that same wall of water destroyed the Egyptians. And he showed his power over the fire, his power over the water, his power over the animals, his power over all things. And when Jesus Christ formed the New Testament, he must show also that he is God. And therefore he showed his power over the animals. When he took those devils and took them out of the man that was possessed by many legions of devils and drove them into a herd of pigs. And these pigs ran over the cliff and into the sea. He showed his power over the rocks. When he, there was an earthquake at the moment of his death. And when he called the Jews that if these were children did not praise me, the very rocks would cry out. He showed his power over all of the nature by calming the storm. He showed that he is truly God. And then he said, this is my religion. This is the New Testament of this religion. And I give you this New Testament. I give you a new priesthood to replace the old priesthood. I give you a new sacrifice of the New Testament priest, which is called the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, to replace the Old Testament sacrifice. And this is the true religion which shall be with you until the consummation of the world. And yet this religion will undergo many tribulations, just as the Old Testament religion underwent many tribulations. And there were many Old Testament Jews that abandoned God and turned to wickedness, so there will be many New Testament Catholics who will abandon God and turn to wickedness. There were many Old Testament priests who were wicked, and so there will be many New Testament priests who are wicked. There were Old Testament Caiaphas and Old Testament high priests who turned against God and were wicked popes of the Old Testament, so there will be wicked popes of the New Testament, but the power of God will conquer them all. And... He will still save souls. His grace still reaches wherever it wishes. He can reach out into the furthest corners of the earth and he can take a soul and he can capture it and he can bring it to him. And those souls that stand next to him but their hearts are blinded and they have turned to wickedness, they will stand next to Christ and they will see nothing. That is why our Lord said, He that has ears to hear, let him hear. Not everyone has ears that hear. He that has eyes to see, let him see. Not everyone has eyes that see. Caiaphas stood closest to the cross. He saw not. Christ spoke his seven last words, and Caiaphas did not hear them. But a thief heard them, and he saw Christ, though he could not turn his head. He saw him by seeing through the Holy Mother Mary. And so it is possible for even if we are nailed to crosses, even if we are condemned, even if we are sent to death from prison, that we will meet Christ. He will come along the way. We may discover that we are crucified on the same day that He is. And if we are on the right side, we can turn away from our sins. God can convert anyone on their deathbed. He can turn anyone back to Him. But they must give their whole being to God. The whole thing. They must be ready to give up all things for the sake of God. And only God knows who is. We all think we're ready to give up our house. We're ready to give up our job. We're ready to give up our possessions. We're ready to give up our health if only we keep God. Until such day as a man comes and says, You need to be quiet about the truth. 
or else you lose your house. And then we make adjustments. God alone knows who really loves Him. With their lips they praise me, He says, but their hearts are far from me. And that is why we follow the example and we turn to the help of the martyrs because they proved that their lips praised Christ and their hearts were most close to Him as well. For they gave up their lives rather than offend God. When Pancratius went to be killed, why did he go to be killed? Because he went to a catechism class. And that was 1,700 years ago. He was caught in a catechism class. Some man was teaching him, a little boy, about 15, 16 years old. He wanted to learn about the faith of Jesus Christ. And he came, and the priest taught him. And he was caught in the class, and therefore they put him to death. In Vietnam, what did the communists do? When they caught the catechists, and they caught the children, they took the children, and they took sticks, and they beat it into their ears, so that they would never hear the word of God again. They took the catechism teachers, and they cut out their tongues, so that they would never be able to speak the catechism again. And that's what they did in Vietnam in the 1960s and 1970s. That is what the communists did. And so, it has not stopped. The enemies of God hate the word of God. The enemies of God hate the truth of God. And God demands that His true religion, which is the total truth, not part of it, that embraces the whole man, not part of him, embraces the all entirety of civilization, and not part of it, he that is not with me completely, is against me. He that gathers not with me totally is against me. These are the words of our King. These are the words of our God. We must beg the grace to accept fully His teaching and His faith, accept fully His doctrine, and come completely into His church. They are outside of that holy church, and outside of that great King, and outside of His mystical body, and all the wonderful things that He has given to us, there is no possibility of salvation. And so let's grab on to him completely and totally in these wicked times, and then he will once again have victory in our wicked world. Because God bless you all, and the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. So today is the fifth Sunday after Easter, a few days before the Ascension, and the Epistle is going to be back here in Calgary. We had a little baptism of a new new baby. In fact, this weekend we had two new babies baptized for the resistance this, this weekend, so two new babies have, have to go on and become vocations, so we need, we need uh, vocations for the latter times. And so we had two new babies this, this weekend, and uh, being baptized, one in St. Mary's, Kansas, uh, another one here. And the epistle for this fifth Sunday after Easter is taken from St. Paul's letter to James, chapter 1. I mean, the epistle of James, chapter 1. Beloved, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man looking at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away, and presently he forgets what kind of man he is. But he who has looked carefully into the perfect law of liberty and has remained in it, not becoming a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, shall be blessed in his deed. And if anyone thinks himself to be religious, not restraining his tongue, but deceiving his own heart, that man's religion is vain. Religion pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to give aid to the orphans and to widows in their tribulation, to keep oneself unspotted from this world. And then the Gospel. Let's take that according to St. John. Chapter 16. At that time Jesus said to his disciples, Amen, amen, I say to you, if 
you ask the Father anything in my name, he will give it to you. Hitherto you have not asked anything in my name. Ask and you shall receive, that your joy may be full. These things I have spoken to you in parables. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in parables, but will speak to you plainly of the Father. In that day you shall ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father for you, for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me, and have believed that I came forth from God. I came forth from the Father, and I have come into the world. Again I leave the world and go to the Father. His disciples said to him, Behold, now thou speakest plainly, and utterest no parable. Now we know that thou knowest all things, and do not need that any one should question thee. For this reason we believe that thou hast camest forth from God. That's why the words of today's Holy Gospel. Father and Son of the Ghost, Amen. <clears throat> Today, a few considerations on this fifth Sunday, just before our Lord enters up into heaven, ascends into heaven. His final words to his apostles before he ascends into heaven. And that uh, we're reminded of this time of getting close to the end of the world, and also at the, the Gospel today, the words of our Lord, Hitherto you have not asked anything in my name, but now you must ask in my name, that your joy may be full. And so we are getting closer to the end of the world. We're getting closer. The apostles were getting very close to Jesus Christ's departure. There were two departures that were going to take place. It was on Holy Thursday night that he said those words, Hitherto you have not asked anything in my name, but now you will have to ask in my name that your joy may be full. And their joy was to be physically with Christ. Their joy was to walk with Him. Their joy was to watch His miracles. Their joy was to be with Him. But then he would leave in a few hours, dying on the cross. And then he would come back for 40 days, but he wasn't even with them during the entirety of those 40 days. He only appeared several times during those days. And so they would see him twice, for instance, only in the first 15 days. Whereas in the normal times, when they were with Christ before, they saw him every day, every single night and every single day. They witnessed his miracles and heard his words and were with him every day. And then finally on Ascension Thursday, he goes up into heaven. And the angels come down and says, he shall return. You shall return as you saw him going up into heaven. And now 2,000 years have passed, and he has not yet returned. And he will return. He will return at the end of the world to judge the living and the dead. And he spoke of this return on Good Friday. On Good Friday, when he was, when he was with, with, with Caiaphas, the head of the church, he told Caiaphas, One day you will see the Son of Man coming with power and majesty. He is going to come with power and majesty. So today I am crucified, but one day I will return in power and majesty. And then between the time, between the time of Jesus Christ's physical going up into heaven, His physical defeat on the cross, His physical resurrection and victory over that cross, the time in which the Holy Ghost descended upon the apostles on Pentecost, and the end of the world, it is a time in which you shall ask anything in my name, and your joy may be full. It is a time of greater joy. And how can it be that the time between Pentecost and the end of the world is a time of greater joy than the time that the apostles walked with Christ during those three and a half years? We are envious of those apostles that we could walk with Christ during those three and a half years. And we don't consider what happened during those three and a half years. We don't consider that during the course of those three and a half years, our Lord Jesus Christ performed miracle after miracle after miracle. 
And wonder after wonder after wonder, both in his preaching and his miracles and his words, in his actions, and everything that he did, every, his very existence was a wonder on this earth. And they were with him. And at the end of that three and a half years, his apostles and all those who believed in him and everyone that was a recipient of the victory of his miracles and the wonder of his miracles, all of them crucified him. All of them turned against him. And so when we look at these three and a half years, from the perspective of eternity, they were not so joyful. But when we travel from those three and a half years down the last 2,000 years, we will find that there was John Chrysostom. We will find that there was Teresa of the child Jesus. We will find that there is even an Augustine who began a wicked life, who began an evil life, the others were good, but when he converted, unlike Peter, he never turned back to sin. And the same is true of many others, whether they be like Ignatius of the Loyola, who lived a wicked life, but when he returned to God, he never returned to sin. And he grew and grew in love and charity each day, and he did wonders, greater wonders than, than the apostles were seemed to be able to accomplish, especially during those three and a half years. Then when did the apostles do their great work? When did the apostles have the greatest joy? When did the apostles become the greatest of all the saints of the last 2,000 years? After Jesus Christ went up into heaven. After the Pentecost. Before the Pentecost, they themselves were not able to have the joy that they had later. The most joyful day in Andrew's life was the day in which he was crucified. The most joyful day in Peter's life was the day in which he was crucified upside down on a cross. The most joyful day in all of these saints' lives was the day in which they could die, those apostles, for Christ. And only John did not die the death of a martyr, but he died, he was all, and he wished to martyr him by boiling him in oil, but then he wasn't boiled, he didn't successfully die. So he is counted as a martyr, but he was considered the martyr of charity, and even he died of the love of God. A love that he had much greater at the age of 100, or 95, or however old, he was very old when he died. A greater love, a greater joy, a greater understanding was in the heart of St. John. Sixty years after he last saw the body of Christ. And so what is it? What is it that makes the joy greater after Jesus Christ is physically gone? And what is it that makes the world, so to speak, more wonderful after Christ has ascended into heaven than when he was walking this earth? And what it is, is our faith. And St. Peter speaks about it in the epistle today. On this fifth Sunday, Saint, or the epistle that's chosen for this day, St. Peter speaks about it in the epistle which is chosen for our scripture reading. And then also St. Augustine speaks about it in the, God, in the sermon for today. And St. Peter says in his epistle, the first epistle of St. Peter, in the chapter 1, which we read in the, in the bravery today. And St. Peter says these words, Peter, the an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the, to the sojourners of the, of the dispersion in Pontus, in Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, chosen unto the sanctification of the Spirit according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, unto the obedience to Jesus Christ and the sprinkling of His blood, grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has begotten and, and, and us again through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from, a, from the dead unto a living hope, unto an incorruptible inheritance, undefiled and unfading, reserved to you in heaven. By the power of God you are guarded through faith for salvation, which is ready to be revealed in the last time. And remember that for the apostles, the last time, it is the time from Pentecost until the end of the world. We are in the last time. This is the time when Christ reveals Himself. This is the time of the victory of faith. And also, 
was already considering this, actually not realizing this would be in the in the in the in the in the reading today. That the it was yesterday walking through the one of the airports on the way from uh, Kentucky to here, and then seeing the guy with his T-shirt, whatever his stupid team was, says never fade, <laughs> says never fade, and that you know that there is then here Saint Saint Peter says our faith will never fade. The faith is not going to fade. Now, if there's ever a time in the history of the world that the faith seems to have faded, that it doesn't have the shine that it used to have, it is in our times. And yet, St. Peter says, this faith shall never fade. It is an unfading faith unto salvation. And over this, over this you rejoice, say, continuing with the same epistle of St. Peter. Over this you rejoice. Though now for a little while, if need be, you are made sorrowful by various trials, and the tempter of your faith, more pernicious, more, oh, excuse me, the, oh, excuse me, there we are, one second. Over this, over this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you are made sorrowful by various trials, and the temper of your faith, more precious than fire, than gold, fire tried may be found unto praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Him, though you have not seen, you love. In Him, though you do not see Him, yet believing, you exult with a joy unspeakable and triumphant, receiving as final issue of your faith the salvation of your souls. So here St. Peter is speaking to people in Rome. They have never seen Christ. Peter saw Christ. Peter was with him. Peter walked in the water with Christ. Peter swam on the shore to Christ. Peter was there with Christ fishing. Peter was with Christ at the crucifixion, though he was at far off and weeping. Peter was there with Christ. Peter was made the head of the church by our Lord Jesus Christ himself. And Peter, St. Peter, speaking to these people of Rome, he says to them that there is a great temper of your faith, which is greater than gold that is impurified and burnt by the fire. Because though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you, the, that, that through love your faith creates your faith creates the love, and through the love, though you have not yet, yet believing, you do not see him, you exult in joy, with an unspeakable and triumphant, receiving as a final issue of your faith the salvation of your souls. We are here and we see Christ. Though we have not seen the glory of his church, we hear the story of the glory days of the Middle Ages. We have not seen those glory days. When we walk out, we see the days of the down negative church. We see the days of uh, homosexual priests and homosexual bishops. We see the days of heresy. We see the days of wickedness. We see the days of ugliness. These are our days. But if we have faith, then we recognize that God is more powerful than the wickedness in this church. God is more powerful than the lack of faith that is found in the Pope who kisses the hand of a priest who is a promoting a, a, a 93-year-old priest promoting homosexuality just a few days ago. He kisses the Pope, kisses his hand, and the Pope uh, re rejoices over this priest who has had a pro-homosexual movement in the Catholic Church for the last 30, 40, 50 years. This is a time of sorrow, it seems. But if we have faith, then we can see through it. Because remember, when Peter looks back, when St. Peter looks back, and he says, how at the time on Good Friday, the very head of the church, the new head of the church, who was himself, who was to replace Caiaphas, and the present head of the church, who was Caiaphas, it was the darkest day of both of them. It was the darkest day of Simon Peter, who said he did not know Christ. It was the darkest day of Caiaphas who arranged the death of Christ. And both of them were guilty. Both of them were guilty. At the scandal of Peter, all of the followers of Christ, of, of the Christ abandoned him. At the scandal of Caiaphas, all the people of the religion that was preparing for Christ abandoned him. 
And when those that are the friends of Christ abandon Him, and those that are the religion of Christ abandon Him, then all the more will all those that are outside of that religion all the more abandon Him. And so there came a great death and a great crucifixion. But when St. Peter looks back upon that day, he weeps. But how does he weep? His weeping is that, as St. Augustine said, on the day of his mother's funeral. St. Augustine said, My brethren, I weep. And do not think I weep for sorrow at my mother's death, for it is not that sorrow that I weep. I weep because she had to weep all of her life for me, and because of her tears that brought about my, 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 my faith, brought about the possibility of my salvation. And I weep that I am separated from her for a brief time, but I do not mourn her death, for she is with God in heaven. Monarch is a saint. But do not be surprised at my tears, for many times I have told you, do not weep at death, and do not think I weep because of death. And if I weep because of death, it is for joy and not for sorrow. Such the tears of Augustine. And so it is that we also must see that as our church appears to be in the closest throes of death, and Caiaphas and Peter, the new Caiaphas, the head of the church, and the new Peter, the one who is supposed to be following the truth, they are abandoning Christ, and they are turning away from Him. And so what do we do? We have faith, and we must recognize that this faith does not fade. Our faith does not fade. The faith is always true. And it is possible to have a greater joy in this crisis than it would be to be walking with Christ to the mountain of Beatitudes. If we were walking with Christ to the mountain of Beatitudes, we would be impressed at the new teacher, but would not know that he was God. We would be impressed with his new teaching, but we would not understand it because it had not been explained to us by the saints. Remember our Lord Jesus Christ Himself said, For you, the apostles, it is given to understand, but for them it is not given to understand. And so there were all those people listening to His words, and they thought it was interesting, just like people today think the words of Christ are interesting, just like the words of Buddha are interesting, and the words of Confucius are interesting, and the words of uh, Martin Luther King are interesting, and the words of Stalin and Lenin are interesting, and the words of Mark are, Marx are interesting, and the words of all these followers of Satan in their various forms, they are all interesting, and so likewise are the words of Jesus Christ very interesting. And this is the way it was. They were with Christ. They even began to believe in Him. But they believed in Him like we believe in a sports team. We hope they win. But when they don't win, we follow another team. When they don't win, we are sorrowful. And we don't understand what happens. And our Lord Jesus Christ knew that He had weak followers. And St. John the Apostle says in his Gospel, for he did not put his confidence in men, for he knew what the heart of man is made of, and therefore he did not put confidence in them. And that same Jesus Christ, the same Jesus Christ, when he came to Moses, he said, Moses, in the Old Testament, through his divinity, Moses, you are the one that must lead the people out of Israel, but I don't want to lead them, you are the one. And also in the New Testament, all these saints, all these great saints, you, Teresa, you are the one. You are the one who will save the, the Carmelite order. Ignatius is the one who will found the Jesuits. And each of the saints is given a specific duty by God. Each one is say, you are the one that I have chosen. Augustine is the one who must be the greatest voice of the fathers of the church. Aquinas, Thomas Aquinas is the one who must be the greatest voice of all of the doctors and fathers together. And Pius X was the one who will hold back the hand of Satan from his victory and hold back the hand of the wrath of God from his justice for another century and let him make it possible for many millions of souls to be saved and to become saints. If there is any possibility of salvation for us in the 20th and 21st century, it is because of Giuseppe Sarto. It is because of he who became St. Pius X. And because he held back the hand of God and he, he slowed down the kingdom of Satan by his oh, short papacy of only ten years. 
and all the great works that he did during that time fighting the devil. And how did he win the battle? Only by faith. And here we consider something that applies to our present situation. St. Paul says, it is by faith that Noah built an ark. And let us consider that ark. How do you build an ark? It's a boat, really. And then remember the ark of Noah was a physical boat. It was a boat that was designed to float in water. Now there was much water in the world in the days of Noah. And when the people came to Noah and they said, Noah, why are you building a boat? And he told them, because God is angry. And because there will be a punishment of this earth. And there will be a punishment of the sins of man. And only those inside of this ark shall be saved. Well then, if you're going to build an ark, Follow the rules of maritime engineering. One of them is, you don't build an ark in a desert. You don't build an ark a thousand miles away from the water. How is it going to float? And furthermore, everyone knows that if the water comes up, look at this, there's a mountain over there, there's a hill over there, there's trees over here. Now if the water comes up, it will be a massively violent, fast-moving water. It will take this boat and it will crash it against the rocks and it will break into pieces and sink. You don't build the water between mount, boat between mountains. You don't build a boat on dry land nowhere near the sea. If you're going to build a boat, at least build it near the port. And if you're going to build a boat, why don't you give it a rudder? It's laying flat on the ground. You're building it too low to the ground. Where is the rudder? How are you going to steer the boat? And so if your worldwide flood does happen, and the whole world is covered with water, then how is the boat going to find land? When the water goes down, you may end up in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And if you end up in the middle of the Pacific, you will die on the boat. The boat will never be able to find land. And so even if we believe in your flood, we can't follow you, Noah, because you are imprudent. You are not following the wisdom of the world. If you want to know how to build boats, if you're going to follow your God and be a nutcase, fine. But don't be that crazy. Don't be that insane. Build the boat in the right way. Give it a rudder. And look how wide the boat is. Look how, how, how square and rectangular the boat is. You can't steer this boat. It will travel so slow that if you're out in the ocean, it'll take you ten years to cross the ocean. Don't build this boat. You are not following the law of prudence. And when you look at all those souls, you're right, Noah, there is evil in the world. But what are you doing? 100 years building this boat. Everyone has told you how bad it is, how stupid it is. And I think you've got a point. The world is wicked. And the world is bad. And we've got to try to make it better. But acting like an idiot in the middle of nowhere building a boat is not the way to do it. And how are the animals going to come on the boat? What are you going to do? Are you going to go out and hunt them down? How are the animals going to get on the boat? This is foolishness. And even if you follow God, follow Him with wisdom, follow Him with prudence. And here, St. Saint, Saint Augustine speaks of this. What makes our faith different? We have virtue, we have faith. And St. Augustine says, I can find it here. Or rather, St. Ambrose, St. Ambrose. Not St. Augustine, but St. Ambrose. St. Ambrose, the one that converted St. Augustine. So St. Ambrose, who knew St. Augustine, St. Ambrose, for it is not for us that we ride, that he rose again. We know how, how grave an outrage it is not to believe in the resurrection. For if we shall not rise again, then Christ died to no purpose. Then Christ has not risen. For it, is, it was not for us that he rose again. Then indeed he has not risen. 
For he himself had no reason to rise again. In him the world rose again. In him heaven rose again. In him the earth rose again. For there shall be a new heaven and a new earth. But for himself there was no need of it. A resurrection for the, ha- for, the, for, the, for the bonds of death did not hold him. Christ did not need a resurrection. For even though as man he died, as yet he was free in hell. Do you wish to know how he was free? I am become as a man without help, free among the dead. And it is well said, free of him who could raise himself up from the dead, according as it is written, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Well again is it said, free of him who descended there, that he might redeem others. And so what's the point of the resurrection, says St. Ambrose? There was no point of the resurrection for Christ, because he can die when he wants and rise when he wants, in the same way that we can go into the kitchen and back into the living room, and then go into the kitchen and back into the living room. So likewise, Christ can die and visit the dead, Come back from life and go and visit the living. Go back to die and visit the dead. Go back to life and visit the living. Therefore, death has no hold on him. Resurrection is of no necessity for him. But then why did he die? And why did he rise? In order that the earth might die, that heaven might die, that the world might die, and rise again. So that there may be a new heaven and a new earth. For it was not for for us... For, for if it was not for us that he rose again, then indeed he has not risen. For he himself had no reason to rise again. In him the world rose again. In him heaven rose again. In him the earth rose again. For there shall be a new heaven and a new earth. Just like after Noah's flood, there was a new heaven and a new earth. Now do we believe in this new heaven, in this new earth, in this new world? The new world is the entirety of the universe, which is now supernatural, which is now ready for Christ, which is ready to make saints. Saints of this new world are going to be greater than any of the saints would have been had Adam not sinned. These saints are greater. Their glory is greater. And while there will be more souls in hell than there would have been had Adam not sinned, there will be greater souls in heaven and a greater glory for them. So do we believe in the new heaven and the new earth or not? And we cannot follow foolish prudence. One thing that we learn from St. Thomas Aquinas, what is virtue? The definition of virtue is to act according to right reason. God gave all of us reason. And when we act according to right reason, we practice virtue. And unless we practice virtue, we cannot go to heaven. And virtue means to act manfully. Vir means the word man, to act with the power of a man. And a man is one who is able to make it through adversity, through difficulties, to act with the power of man according to the reason of man. That's virtue. To act with the power and strength of man. A woman is the weaker sex. A man is a stronger one. Therefore he acts with a power that is stronger than the woman. And according to the reason of man, which also is greater than the reason of woman. And therefore, to act according to virtue equals to act with the power of man according to the reason of man towards a good end. But what happens when God gives us supernatural faith? What happens when He gives us the faith of a, that is the belief in our Lord Jesus Christ having died, having risen from the dead, having given us a holy church, having given us a, a, a more wonderfully created Recreated heaven, recreated earth, recreated world, recreated universe for the sake of a supernatural glory in heaven. Then we must have a new reason. We must have a new man. And we must have a new power of man. The new reason is called faith, which is not the same as natural reason. The new man is called Christ, who is nothing like Adam. And the new power is the power of the crucifixion which is nothing like the power of a man lifting weights. These are the powers of virtue. And why St. Thomas Aquinas says there are two virtues that should not be confused, and one is called prudence, and the other is called prudence. And one is called justice, and the other is called justice. And one is called temperance, and the other is called temperance. 
and one is called fortitude and the other is called fortitude, but they are eight different virtues that are not the same as each other. For there is natural prudence which follows natural reason. There is supernatural prudence which follows faith. There is natural justice which follows natural reason. And there is supernatural justice which follows faith. It was supernatural justice that made Peter go to his cross and Andrew run to his cross. It was supernatural prudence that made Andrew run to his cross and become Saint Andrew. That Peter asked to be crucified upside down to become the great Saint Peter. It was a supernatural prudence that made Augustine switch from a heretic unto a great saint and father of the church. And what is this supernatural prudence? To judge according to faith. And what is the sin presently residing in the society of St. Pius X? They claim they are following prudence. Like Father Thiemann said in his talk last year, it's a matter of prudence. And the matter of prudence is a judgment, a practical judgment, which is made by the superior. That's what they say. According to what he sees is the best thing to do. Because after all, the superior, he sees things that we don't see. He understands things we don't understand. And so therefore, we should follow his prudential judgments, and we should never question them. It's just a matter of prudence. If this was true, little Catherine would not have stood up against the emperor. Daniel would not have stood up against the two judges. And all the saints that call themselves martyrs, would not have stood up against all those that martyred them. We do not follow the prudence of the superior. We do not follow the prudence of reason. We follow the prudence of the supernatural faith. St. Pius X speaks of this prudence in a very beautiful motu proprio that he wrote in 1907 on November the 18th called Scripturae, the Prestantia Scripturae, the excellence and magnificence of Scripture. On July the 3rd of that year, he put out the Lamentabile Sane with the syllabus of errors of the modernists. But then the modernists said, it doesn't say De Fide on it, so we don't have to follow it. On September the 8th of the same year, he explained that they were heretics, and he put out his encyclical Pascendi. And in Pascendi, he pointed out the system of the modernists, how it is the synthesis of all heresies and the most wicked evil of our times that must be extirpated. In the last half of the cynical, he gave strict orders to all the bishops and all the heads of seminaries and all the heads of religious orders to go with an iron hammer and smash all the modernists in their seminaries, smash them in their universities, burn all their books, and remove these wicked men and their wicked teaching from the Catholic Church. And then they said, it's not infallible. So then a month, two months later, on November the 8th, November the 18th, of the same year, 1907, he put out his Tristens Tristantia Scripturae. And in this Tristantia Scripturae, he says, anyone who holds an opinion that is in any way whatsoever contrary to the doctrines contained in Lamentabili Sane, those syllabus of errors, and in Pascendi Dominici Gregis, is automatically excommunicated. Automatically. And furthermore, every single Catholic bishop and authority in Christendom must make sure that especially these wicked books of the modernists must be removed completely. That's not prudent. Because at that time, you know, there were so many modernists in the church in 1907. So many modernist cardinals, so many modernist bishops, so many modernist priests. And many of them were innocent. They were just following the teaching of their day. They didn't have bad intentions. They didn't mean any harm. They just were following the teachings of their day, which was so prevalent at the end of the 19th and early 20th century. And what did St. Pius then say? If any seminarian, one made for the religious orders, shows any sign whatsoever, even the faintest 
he, or he gives even the faintest reason for doubt that he may not, that he does not hold the positions contained in Providence of the day and the, these documents condemning the modernists, let him be thrown out without any hesitation. Why does he say that? Because he recognizes that there is only one weapon that defeats the devil, and that is the faith whole and entire without any admixture with error. This is the only weapon that defeats the devil. And the devil tries to get in and twist the faith. And one of the ways that he tries to do it is through human prudence. And St. Pius X says, this false prudence is one of the main weapons of the modernists. You must be patient. You must go slowly. You must go step by step. But he says clearly, we will extirpate all these books. Burn them. Remove them. If a Catholic bookstore says it's, that it's still a Catholic bookstore and it prints these books, call it a condemned bookstore and remove the name Catholic from it. If a Catholic university is teaching this garbage or even allows it to be let in or allows a, the semblance of this modern heresy of modernism to be let in, then let it be no longer called a Catholic university. If anyone has received his licentiate and his degrees and he, is, and he has tainted by these errors, let them be taken away from him. And if anyone holds any opinion that is in any way whatsoever a promotion of these modern heresies, of this modernism which is the synthesis of all heresies, he is automatically excommunicated, reserved to the apostolic see and the Roman pontiff. Such was the behavior of St. Pius X because he was a man of faith. And we must recognize in this great fight the faith is still the one weapon that defeats Satan. It is the only weapon that defeats him. And we cannot compromise with that faith. And we must recognize that even in the midst of the great wickedness of our times, it is possible to have a greater joy than the apostles had when they walked with Christ during those three and a half years. And therefore, we don't want to go back to those three and a half years. Just like in a good marriage, you don't want to go back to the honeymoon. We don't want to go back to those three and a half years. We want something better. We want that faith in our hearts, which is good for our salvation, says St. Peter. And remember, says St. Ambrose, that it made he made a new heaven. He made a new world. He made a new earth. Let us live in that new heaven, new earth, and new world. And let us firmly believe that it is more powerful than the wicked old one infiltrated by the devil. And remember the greatest creation of our Lord Jesus Christ. The greatest new creation is His Holy Mother. We don't want to be the children of Eve anymore, though we are grateful that Eve gave us our bodies. We don't want to be the children of Eve anymore. We want to be the children of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And she is so much more wonderful. She is the new Eve. And if she is the new Eve, and how can we compare her with, with Eve Eve is nothing compared to the new Eve. So likewise, the new heaven is nothing compared to the old heaven. The old heaven that God prepared for Adam had he been a good boy. Adam doesn't want to be in that heaven. Adam repented. Adam is now in the heaven. The heaven that was created by the new heaven and the new earth. And Adam is happier in the new heaven than he ever would have been had he never fallen and gone to the old one. And so, as they, as they say on Holy, Third, Holy Saturday night, O oh, happy fault oh, oh, that brought about such a wonderful redemption, we must believe in that happy fault. We must be grateful to Adam for his mistake. And we must recognize that had Adam not made that mistake, and that grave sin called the original sin, we could not know about this new heaven or new earth. We could not be born. We could not live. We could not have the hope of eternal salvation. But we have that hope only because of Adam's weakness and Eve's weakness which made for us Jesus Christ and the Blessed Virgin Mary. And how could we want to live without them? This new heaven and this new earth is everything. And we must believe in it no matter how wicked our world becomes. And we must have a great confidence and a great faith in this new heaven, this new earth, this new world which is the world created by Christ, not the foolish lies of the devil. Of course, I God bless you all, and the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.